Welcome to the shop. I'm Jared and this is the Questionable Garage. And if you notice, I'm dressed kind of nice. Well, nice for me. This is not my normal shop attire. And that's because in today's episode, I'm Jared, the car reviewer. Well, not car reviewer, I'm the Supra reviewer. I have more than 20 years of wrenching experience on the Toyota Supra. I did it professionally for over a decade at a premier specialty shop only on the Toyota Supra. So I feel pretty qualified to answer this question, and it's one I am certain everyone has asked. Did 30 years make the Toyota Supra better? I have right here on my right, a right-hand drive, the, kind of the hated generation of Supra. The Mark III does not get a lot of love. It's my personal favorite. Hands down, it's my favorite. I told you the story about this exact car and my silver Supra. They mean so much to me, but the Supra community hates them. They get a bad rap because of the 7M. This kind of rectifies it a little bit. It has the 1JZ 2.5 liter twin turbo engine and it's wonderful. It is absolutely amazing. And it goes away today, which is kind of sad. It's we'll, we'll get to that in just a little bit. But to my left, the contender, the A90 BMW Toyota marriage, the new Supra. And it is a uh, car that I'm kind of dreaming over. We have an entire video series about me trying to get one of the brand new manual ones. Right when they were coming out is when the company I work for was kind of going out of business. So I've never even had my butt in the seat of a Mark V. So I'm really excited about this video to take this car out for a drive and experience it because I maybe don't want one. I, I don't know. So we are gonna go through and address some of the biggest differences of the two cars. Um, I'll compare a little bit of the fourth generation Super from my experience with that. And at the end of the video, I'm gonna be able to answer, again, that same question. Did 30 years make the Toyota Super better? All right, but before I go for the drive, I do need to address the fact that, yes, it, it is sold. The buyer is here to pick up the twin turbo R. Um, it, it's not easy. I, I love this car, but it was the right choice. I had a lot of you reach out and were excited to potentially buy the Supra from me. And uh, this will hurt Ed Bullion's soul to hear. I did not take the highest offer. I was looking for the right buyer. My wife was a big part of the selection process, honestly, too, because we love the car. We just love another one a lot more, and this is gonna help fund that. So there was someone that had the same passion that I did when it came time for buying it. When it was coming in, um, I had to scrib scramble. I had to sell a couple things and you know, kind of just hurry to get the deposit and get the money to buy the car. And the person reached out and was like, hey, I really want it, but I need to do this, this, and this first. And well, that, that struck a chord, you know, like it, it, it was how I was. There was the same level of excitement. So let's introduce Nathan. Hello, how was your flight? Uh, it was long, um, it's Atlanta. There, I, if we could just not have to go through Atlanta, I'd be a lot happier, but I have not figured out how to do that yet. It's so a gorgeous airport though. The airport is quite nice. I did just, I did tell you, this is a 30 year Toyota. And there are some quirks about, you know, the early 90s, you know, Japanese cars. I, I did warn you that, right? Yeah, but I mean, dude, it's a Supra. Before you came down, I just did another timing belt, valve stem seals, fresh oil change, fresh trans fluid, fresh diff fluid, fresh brake fluid, coolant, cooling fan fluid. Um, just had it detailed. So it's, what do you think of it? It's a Supra. <laughs> Fair enough. It is, a, it is indeed a Supra. So... The cardinal rule of selling a car, this is to you guys, do not go for the last drive. There are so many stories about the people crashing a collector car that they're selling. It, it's been hard not to, but I also don't want to fall back in love with it. So what do you say? You, you take your new Super out for a drive. I will take a Mark V out for a drive and uh, we both get to experience something new. Yeah, let's go.
Well, I, I really didn't love seeing that in the rear view mirror because I know I'm not gonna see it much longer. Uh, what'd you think? It's a Supra. <laughs> Maybe I just need a shirt, it's a Supra. The dog box is a little different, right? Yeah, it's almost like you're killing it every time. <laughs> that, that just means it's happy. So I do know you have about a six hour drive ahead of you at least. Um, you still need to get familiar with the car. And honestly, to finish the comparison, I don't need the Mark III here because I've got a lot of experience with it. So um, you probably want to hit the bathroom before the road and I'm just going to go inside so I don't have to see it leave. So I guess goodbye. Yeah. Oh, take care of it. Thank you very much. Take care of it. the the one thing about the the new Supra oh, compared compared to the uh, Mark III the Mark IV oh and even the Mark II it's not the easiest to get into for uh, a six foot seven man the good news is I'm losing weight we're down 20 pounds but I don't see more weight actually uh, improving the size of the hole that you climb in and out of. It is, uh, it's small in here. Buckled up for safety. And that's really one of the first things that I need to address about the new Toyota Supra. Um, it's smaller and there is a reason for it. The previous generations of the Toyota Supra are not sports cars. I know there's some uh, YouTubers that like to call everything a sports car, but realistically, the Skyline GTR, the 3000 GT, the uh, Dodge Stealth, which is the 3000 GT, Toyota Supra, they are GT cars, grand touring cars. The Acura NSX, the Nissan 300ZX, those are sports cars. They're more akin to what this new Supra is. The new Supra is not a Grand Tour, it is a sports car. It was made smaller, it was made more nimble, and it fits a very different role than the old car. The old car was meant to have a lot of driving pleasure, be able to be capable in corners, but have good power and just able to eat up roads. You would jump in it and be able to take it on a long, comfortable road trip. This, I have friends that have driven many miles in a fifth gen Toyota Supra and it forces a lot of brakes. It is not a car, even, they're not people built like me, if, if we're being honest, I'm, I'm a big guy. So most cars can be difficult for me to take a long road trip, but these are, a more average build and they experience a lot of problems trying to go on long drives. The seat's stiff, um, it's very comfortable and form-fitting for corners, but at the end of the day, the new Supra is a sports car. Every Supra beforehand is a Grand Tour. That, that is not something you can argue with me. It is a statement of fact, just by the nature of the car. Just let, let's start comparing some things. Both of the cars have headlights. Some people like the design, the split 
LED beam of the new style Supra. But personally, the old Supra's way cooler because they do this. Yeah, pop-up headlights are cool, you know? Like, you don't need them all the time. Let them just sit there and not be, uh, be an eyesore when you're just driving around. Uh, they both have mirrors. Um, the third gen Supra's folding mirrors are known to crack and have some defects. There are solutions to that. Mark V mirrors, when you roll the windows down, it has, I think, the worst buffeting problem, that loud thumping air pressure of any car I've experienced. I roll it down and it physically hurts just from that buffing vibration. Let's talk interior, right? We've got a much better infotainment system in theory in the new car, than the new Supra. Benefit of the older Supra, you put in whatever head unit you want and you can have as modern as you want. What you get in this car is what you get and unfortunately it is very BMW. Uh, there's no surprise Toyota did work with BMW to build this car. There's rondels all over the place. Um, I just really wish Toyota had taken a little bit of effort to kind of hide it a little bit. Different voice, the different door chimes or confirmation, anything. It all just sounds very BMW. It's not a bad thing, it's just a thing. In the new car, you get things like blind spot monitoring, uh, the backup camera, which you can add to the other cars. Uh, there's aftermarket ways to add it, but from the factory, this is a way more equipped vehicle. You get that with a modern car, technology changes, but you have to have it in this car. Um, the blind spots, the C pillars behind me, the worst blind spot of any vehicle I have driven not look over your shoulder and see anything. You have to rely on your mirrors and the blind spot monitors in this car, which I'm not a fan of. There's there's something to be said about visually double checking what is around you. And that is just a big win for all of the other Supras, not even just the Mark III, is cabin visibility. But again, that is a big you know difference that you run into between a GT car and a sports car. One of the biggest reasons that Toyota went with BMW in this partnership is BMW is one of the last holdouts of the inline six turbocharged performance engine. Uh, the Supras have always been inline six and it was a very important thing for Toyota to keep a turbocharged inline six in the new Supra. If Toyota had to do the entire process of an EPA certification and development of an inline six, we very likely would have never seen a new Supra. Like it just, it made no sense for them to go through that entire process. The B58 in the earlier A90 Supras made, I believe, 338 horsepower. Later on in the A91, it got slightly higher compression and it bumps it up to almost 400 horsepower. And the two and a half liter twin turbo engine that you get in the uh, Mark III, it makes 280 horsepower and it has two turbos. Two is always better than one, right? In the Mark V, we have a ZF eight speed automatic transmission, very similar to just about every performance series car anymore. It runs the ZF transmission. It's incredibly capable. It is a lot of fun. It shifts very quickly and it, it's not a disappointing transmission at all. You now can get a manual transmission. So I'm trying to track down and see if I can find a CU later uh, Mark V with a manual. In the Mark III, you get an R154 five-speed manual transmission. It is known more as a truck transmission because that's really what it is. It's a heavy-duty transmission. Synchronizers don't like the high-speed RPM, and that is why in my particular one that is now Nathan's, uh, it has a dog box. The dog teeth, the synchronizer have been re removed and replaced with dog teeth that allow for much quicker shifting. It's noisier, but it, I, it's a good compromise for being able to shift the car at high RPM and drive it in anger. Here we go, let's just enjoy the soundtrack. Now, of course, being a modern car, they tune in those wonderful little shift burbles, but the teenager in me loves them. Uh, in my ISF, it makes those sounds naturally just from the performance modifications I've done to it, but 
we can all thank the Jag F-Type for uh, introducing factory cars to that just absurd, you know, burping and farting sound from the tailpipe. Also comparing interior spaces, trunk size comes in as a very key important feature. Due to the exterior design styling, the trunk space gets pinched down just a little bit in the Mark V Supra, whereas in the Mark III, I can easily fit two Great Pyrenees. Now, that's also not to say I couldn't fit two Great Pyrenees in a Mark V Supra, but this is a Toro rental, and I want to be respectful of someone else's car, and uh, putting two large, hairy dogs in it, it's not very respectful. So this is my first time really getting to drive the new Supra. I've, again, driven all other generations, have a lot of experience with them, and a, a love for all of them. And it, it feels really good to get to be behind the wheel of this car and put some miles on it and just get a good feel for what this car is. We'll get back to the shop and I'll get to share with you kind of just my thoughts of how this car is. Is it a Supra? Uh, is it fun to drive? We can already answer this question. Do I fit in it? Not well. But I, I am sitting in it. I am, I am in it and I am driving it. I'm enjoying these country roads. And uh, man, is it a Supra? It's time to answer the question. Did 30 years make the Supra better? Is the 91 better than the 2021? And it's really complicated. And the reason I say that is in 30 years, Toyota did make the Supra a better car. When I was coming back from the airport after picking up Nathan, and we got stuck in Atlanta rush hour. Stop and go. The just creeping along, you're going half a mile an hour. I was happy in this car. The, the infotainment, the radio, the climate control, the just comfort of the car. And in that aspect, this Supra does car things way better than the other cars. They, the Mark IIs, threes, fours, ones, all of the other Supras, they do car things. This was just, it was, it was pleasant to be in stop and go traffic in. And I'll be honest, I've never legitimately felt that way in another Supra. So yes, it is better than the other Supras. You, you can do that with technology, who knew? The second, kind of question I wanted to answer as part of the series. Is this a Supra? Under, deep under its skin, it is a BMW chassis, a BMW engine. We talked about it in the car. They had to really go that way to be able to bring us this car um, because it had to have an inline six. And that's where the, the question poses another question. What is a Supra? And I was against the car a lot when it first came out personally, but when you started seeing the Toyota press vehicles, when the president comes up to this car and says, my friend is back, that really kind of was the moment for me to kind of look beyond the BMW partnership and look at the essence of Supra and the performance and its capabilities and really as hokey as it is, the friendship you build with the cars. Perfect example of that is Faye Hadley, Pistons and Pixie Dust on uh, All Girls Garage. She has kept the same A70 Supra, the Mark III Supra. She's a champion for the 7M engines. She has crashed it multiple times and keeps rebuilding the same shell, even though she's been told by a lot of people to give up on it, but that's her Supra, that's her essence, that's her driving passion. Just like I told you the story of my silver Supra and why the Twin Turbo R went away. The funds from selling the Twin Turbo R go right in to my heart Supra. Yes, this is a Supra. It deserves the namesake. 
I'm not even talking about driving performance and the, the turbos and all of, all of the things that you see a Supra. The soul and essence is what it incites as an emotion and there is an emotional response from this car. It is a Supra 100%. The last question, what is the better driving experience? This thing is unbelievable in corners and it has lots of power to accelerate and go and then it can be mild natured and do that incredibly well and it has the, the stop start features for saving fuel. It's really good at all that stuff, but what's better driving? And that's the twin turbo R. Hands down, the twin turbo R, any turbo Supra, to me those are all better driving experiences than this because they're so analog. You are part of it. These modern cars are amazing, but they're way too digital. That's why if I got one, it has to be the manual transmission, so there's still a little bit of that left. There's something about the, the, the earlier cars. When you're driving, this, they make the right sounds. The engines don't have decorative covers on them. You see an engine it had to be a pretty aesthetic thing where these new cars are just all plastic and hidden. And it's not to say this is not a good driving experience. It's just if you're wanting a pure, just distilled essence driving experience, all of the previous generation Supras are better for it. That analog visceral feeling, you, you give it up in this car. Unfortunately, that's, that's the reality of it. But if you needed a lot of fun and a good car, and you, I've had so many people excited to see this thing and waving out mirrors, it, it's, it's amazing. And I guess bonus question four, am I still trying to sell and trade up to get a see you later manual, even though I don't fit the best in it? Yes. I'll figure out a way to get the seat to, to let me fit a little bit more. So yes, this is the end of another slightly different, not super wrenching video, but I was saying goodbye to a car I loved and wanted to be able to share the experience of the new Super with you and the fact that we're still gonna keep wrenching. We've got the Jeep to finish and uh, get it to its, uh, its owner. There's one already lined up for it and uh, get started on the third car in the flip series and uh, on top of that, we've got some more amazing adventures and road trips and other project cars and to get parts for our other cars. There's just a lot going on. And while we're waiting for parts and things to get in, we've, we're still working, we're still doing stuff and I wanna share as much as I can along with you guys. I'm Jared reminding you guys to always make questionable choices and sometimes it's okay to meet your heroes. They're, they're not all bad. We'll see you later.